Okay, so today we're going to talk about toxicology. And toxicology really is a study of any poison's effect on the body. And we can come into contact with these poisons in various different ways. There's lots of different routes of exposures. It could be an ocular uh, exposure, inhalational, ingestions, dermal, and yes, even rectal. And before we go any further, I wanted to stress the number uh, of the Illinois Poison Control Center. This is something very important, uh, worth knowing, worth memorizing, and that's 1-800-222-1222. The number is even easier to remember, 222-1222. And I think the number is the same across the country. This is an invaluable resource that we have at our disposal. You can use it as a physician, call them up and ask them what to do about certain exposures, and you can even use it as a layperson if you're at home and you accidentally drank some Drano. Is, this, is that a problem? You can call them and they're going to tell you what to do. So if you ever see any political things saying the Illinois Poison Control Center needs some money, I think it's worth supporting that cause. And now let's talk about some of the most common uh, presentations. So the most common call to a poison control center is going to be a pediatric accidental ingestion. That's like a kid who took a pill, ran into grandma's bottles and took something. The most common reason for coming to the emergency room is going to be a suicidal ingestion, an intentional ingestion. And finally, worldwide, the most common reason for death is carbon monoxide poisoning. And now let's start with our evaluation of the patient. And that always in the emergency room starts with your primary survey, your airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, and so these things are the, if they're wrong, they're going to kill the patient immediately. So you need to get on top of those things. However, there's a new letter down here, and that's the letter D. And that's decontamination. Decontamination is if there's a poison that's on the patient and it gets on you, it's going to cause problems with you as well. And so this also has to be done at the same time as the primary survey. And so you may want to put on some protective gear while you're addressing all of this stuff. And what exactly is decontamination? Well, it's irrigation mostly. And you may have heard the saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. And that's what applies here. So let's say you've got a, an ocular exposure. Someone gets something in their eyes. You're going to wash that out with normal saline. Or they get some dermal exposure. They get it on their skin. Soap, a mild soap and water is really all you need to get it off of them and hopefully not cross-contaminate yourself. And then initially, you're also going to want to do a couple of things, especially if you have a comatose patient. And so this is commonly referred to as the coma cocktail. And it spells don't, D-O-N-T. The first letter D is for dextrose, D50. If a patient is hypoglycemic, that may be one reason why they are comatose. So you want to give them some sugar. Now, if you have the opportunity to check their sugar with an AccuCheck, do that first. And if they're not hypoglycemic, you don't have to give them any sugar. Next is oxygen. If hypoxemia is the cause, Go ahead and put them on two liters. Really, any comatose patient, we're going to put on some oxygen. Remember our mantra from earlier, IVO2 monitor. The same applies here. The N stands for Narcan. So if you have a patient who's comatose because of an opiate, like a heroin ingestion, then Narcan may be helpful. And the doses range anywhere from 0 0.4 to 2 milligrams. And you may have to give repeated doses, so you might give 2, and then 4, and then 6, and then 8, and then 10 milligrams in order to get someone to be awake. But let me give you a word of caution with Narcan here. Try to use the smallest dose that you can get away with. If you have a patient who's just high on heroin and they're out, and you give them a bunch of Narcan, and now they wake up, not only have you taken away their high, You've given them withdrawal symptoms, so now they're angry that you took away their high, and they're vomiting, and they got diarrhea. And so this is just a mess. You don't want to have to even deal with that. So use the minimum dose that you can get away with. The last letter is T, thiamine. And we've always been taught that you want to give 100 milligrams of thiamine to the patients uh, just so you don't precipitate a Wernicke's uh, before, you know, by giving, the, uh, giving them sugar. Now, this is purely theoretical. I don't know that this ever really happens. Plus, most of us give D50 without giving thiamine. So if you really are suspecting that they are acting wacko, meaning they have a Wernicke's and they have ataxia, confusion, and ophthalmoplegia, so you have an alcoholic who is nutritionally depleted, then the dose for treatment is 500 milligrams. It's not 100 milligrams. So this is really not very helpful that 100 milligram dose so if you really are suspecting it give that and the, another drug that we were hopeful that was going to be added to our coma cocktail was flumazenil uh, 
uh, and that would be a drug that reverses benzodiazepines. Now think of it like the Narcan for benzos. However, it didn't play out like that. Most patients have taken more than one drug, and so what ends up happening is if they've taken something that lowers their seizure threshold, that is something that's going to make them seize, any benzos they take and any benzos that are on board, it's helpful. And so if you remove that, now you got a patient who's a little bit comatose and seizing, which is never good. So we don't use flumazenil in this way. Flumazenil is may be used if you're doing a conscious sedation and you yourself gave the benzo, so you know that it's an isolated benzodiazepine overdose because you did it, or possibly if you have a kid who took a pill. Uh, and Because kids, little kids, they don't normally take a whole bunch of medicines, but you can never really be sure if grandma keeps all her pills in one of those uh, pill containers, who knows what's in there. So you have to be sure it's just benzos before giving flumazenil. If you want to be safe, just don't do it. Stick with don't. Dextrose, oxygen, Narcan, and thiamine. And so now let's talk about our toxicologic history. And so there's a bunch of things that you're really going to be worried about here, such as is this an acute ingestion or has this been going on for a long time? Is it acute versus chronic? If you can get the type of the toxin taken, that'd be great. But a lot of times that information isn't available. The time of ingestion. And also important is why did they do it? Was this an accidental ingestion or was it a suicidal attempt? Now with your histories, remember that intoxicated patients will oftentimes be unreliable, so you can't necessarily trust what they say. So how are you going to get information? Well, you could ask family members who are there, maybe paramedics or police who are at the scene, or you could even dispatch someone to go back to the scene and uh, see if they can find any empty pill bottles. It's usually not going to be the doctor who does that like happens on house, but I've sent back family members or even paramedics or police. Now let's talk about the physical. And you're going to be looking at a couple of areas specifically, and we're going to talk about why. And that's going to be the vital signs, the eyes, a neuro exam, a skin exam, bowel sounds, and any smells that you might have. And a couple of good places to look to see how wet someone is is their mucous membranes and their axilla. Of course, you're going to want to do a good history and physical, but we want to pay attention specifically to these areas, and I'll tell you why in the next video when we introduce the toxidromes or the toxic syndromes. All of these features can help you narrow down the possibilities of what the toxin they may have ingested is. Okay, see you in the next video.